This is a relationship that breaks every rule in the book. Some of the most dangerous predators on our planet accepting a human into their midst. Ever get the feeling you've been surrounded by lions? <laughs> I get it every day. It has taken Kevin Richardson years of patience and dedication to build these unique bonds. But keeping predators in captivity is fraught with difficulty. Introducing young lions to each other is proving unpredictable. There's a battle developing with the hyenas. A surprise arrival catches everyone unawares. And Kevin faces a race against time to save the animals and the sanctuary where they live. I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. This is the kingdom of the white lion, a 1,730-acre private wildlife sanctuary run by Kevin Richardson. It's home to some of Africa's most dangerous and rarest predators. Black leopards, hyenas, and lions. And this is one of the largest and most impressive prides in the park, the Big Kings. The family is headed by four males, two tawny lions, Rafiki and Siam, and two white lions, Alex and Kaiser. But they are growing restless. White lion Kaiser is challenging the other males for dominance. Kevin fears one of them might get injured, so he's stepping in as peacemaker. Little big, little big boy. Little big boy. Down you go. Guys, is trying to sit on my shoulder. He's, he's, gonna, he's trying to break my back. As soon as he reached sexual maturity, everything changed. Um, and he just became interested in one thing, and that was the woman. He's just uh, taken it upon himself to be dominant over them all the time, and he gets extremely aggressive and unpredictable. And this results in extreme fighting uh, between him and the other lions in this group. One lioness in particular is the object of Kaiser's affection, Ishka. The kingdom doesn't have the space or money for any new cubs, and so all the females are given contraceptive implants to prevent them from breeding. But with the females not coming into season, it means the males can no longer act out their instinct to mate. Kevin has noticed this sometimes makes them tense and frustrated. And with Kaiser's behavior worsening, Kevin needs to find him a new home. It's only a matter of time before we land up with someone or some uh, lion being killed in this group um, or exorbitant vet bills because the lion's got its half his face hanging off. And that's, that's the reason why we're going to have to uh, move him on. 38 lions live at the kingdom, all of them bred in captivity. Among them, seven rare white lions identical to their tawny relatives, except for their coloring. But keeping so many big predators comes with a heavy price tag. To run a park of this nature, you are looking in the region of around about 15 to $20,000 a month. And that's just maintenance, anti-poaching patrols, staff, keeping the electric fences clean, you got your little magic pliers. You know, feeding the lions, watering the lions, making sure they've got proper veterinary health care, 
They've been detected. Vehicles, petrol, fetching food. It's a big job. Uh, people, people don't realize what, what a mammoth job it is, taking on, looking after uh, a lot of lions. You know, not just one lion. It's, you know, a lot of mouths to feed. Kevin helped set up the kingdom in 2005 to house the production of a fictional movie following the story of a white lion. He was in charge of looking after all the animals on set. Today, the retired white lions that starred in the movie live out their days here, alongside Kevin's favorite lions from his former job at another park. The investor behind the movie also funds the kingdom. As Kevin deals with the daily challenges of meeting the needs of the animals, he now faces more pressure than ever. The private funding behind the sanctuary is running out, and the bills are piling up. There are troubled times ahead. Kevin urgently needs to find a way for the kingdom to become financially self-sufficient. There's a lot resting on the success of the film. If it's popular, it could provide enough funds to secure the kingdom's immediate future and buy time to find another way to fund the sanctuary. Bandit, you're heavy, my buddy. If, if the film, you know, for whatever reason now doesn't get out there, um, the consequences are that the park might have to shut down and we might be having to find homes for 37 lions, 20 odd hyena, and the rest of the, you know, the animals that live here. But it would be all for naught, my life's work, if, uh, if that happened. And, um, yeah, I can't even begin to imagine that, so. Kevin also has his own growing pride to worry about. Today, wife Mandy is taking their baby son Tyler to see the lions for the very first time. But for the family, the daily strain of running the kingdom is starting to take its toll. Behind the scenes, obviously running a park of this magnitude, and it's a constant worry for us because if we don't find the income and keep things going, then what happens to the animals, which is obviously Kevin, my number one priority. And with a battle for supremacy developing in another pride, it's time for Kevin to step in again. Youngsters Tristan, Zippo, and Nash are starting to feel the wrath of their father's dominance. That ear is ringing. They're approaching the age when, in the wild, they would leave the pride and form one of their own. Kevin needs to intervene before one of them is injured. He has decided to remove them and form a new pride with another group of youngsters, Bobcat, Bandit, and Gabby. If the introduction works, it means there will be less risk of fighting. Today's a real big day. Um, we've got Tristan and Zippo and Nash finally leaving the nest and coming to reside with uh, Bobcat and Bandit's group. So it's a momentous day. We've been doing this over a couple of weeks now and everything's looking good. Um, I just don't know. It's, this is the interesting thing about doing this kind of thing. You never know. You can do it 10 times and it can go one way and then you get the 11th time and it does a completely different thing. It's a big responsibility. Kevin's unique insight into the dynamics of the pride is key to a successful introduction. But there's an added complication. I'll tickle you today. I'm going to tickle you today. Spunny the hyena. <laughs> Spunny was hand reared alongside Bobcat, Bandit, and Gabby from just a few days old. This unusual pride defy the wisdom that lions and hyenas are arch rivals and will attack each other at any opportunity. Spunny has little idea how to behave around other hyenas. And if he is introduced to them now, he is likely to be seriously injured. For his own safety, he'll stay in the pride where he knows how to behave best, like an honorary lion. With the lions, actually, he lives a pretty cool life. He's one of the pride. They live a very lazy life. 
They're both very social animals. Best of mates, in fact. Let's go. In you go. In you go. Get in. Whether Spunny accepts newcomers Tristan, Zippo and Nash into his lion pride remains to be seen. We're going to release them today, uh, see how it goes today, especially with Spunny's, the, the hyena. And depending how it goes by, by 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock's the feeding time. If it's all going well, we'll feed them together. If we suspect that it's a little bit awkward and things aren't going so well, then we'll maybe remove them and take them back. Helping Kevin is his right-hand man, Rodney Nambakana, the only other person to handle the animals at the kingdom. Young lions are notoriously unpredictable. As they sort out their new hierarchy, nervous tension can easily turn to aggression. When they fight like that, and I mean, it makes a lot of noise. And, and to a human being, it seems very scary. But to lions with their thick skin and all of that, just a, a wah, 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 they immediately are showing who's more dominant than the next. With one group deciding to lay low, for now, it's a stalemate. Bobcat, Bandit, and Gabby seize the chance to take sides with Kevin. So at the moment, we're in a bit of a apartheid situation. We've got this group, um, including Spunny. Spunny's is on the periphery, and myself, and the three newcomers, <laughs> and it's segregation. But it's gone really well. I'm, I'm really happy about it. There's been a little bit of nose touching and, and that kind of interaction. No aggression from either side. The two groups soon banish their initial nerves and start to make friends. That's fantastic. As they settle, it's Spunny's turn to find his place in the pride and join in the fun. Hyena wins. But the new pride still has to pass the biggest test of all. It's time for them to share their first meal. And with excitement running high, no one knows how to go around. And of course, Spunny makes sure that he gets a lion's share. For now, the pride seem happy, but in the next few weeks, Kevin hopes two more lions will join them, if they're accepted. With the new pride settled, Kevin turns his attention to another problem. Thor is one of the lead stars in the White Lion movie. But with Thor's acting days behind him, Kevin is now facing a dilemma. Unlike all the other lions at the kingdom, he lives entirely on his own. The only other member of his pride is Kevin. Long walks through the reserve provide much needed companionship. But despite Kevin's best efforts, he is increasingly concerned that Thor is lonely. When the days go by and, and I've had a busy week, the only lion that really is in the back of my mind is old Thor because I know he definitely needs some love and attention. Out of all the lions I walk with, this must be my favorite because I know how much he needs this enrichment. This is really important to him living as a bachelor. So, you know, whenever he sees me, it's like, come on, Kev, can we go for a walk? Can we go for a walk in the greater area? So I try and take him out more than the others because they've got, you know, each other's company. Hello, my big boy. <laughs> what you been doing? Hey, you having fun? Kevin realizes he's no substitute for the real thing. He needs to find Thor some lion suitors. Come, boy but they will need to hold their own against this big male. Only two lionesses at the kingdom could fit the bill. Kasasa and Sabindi might just have what it takes. But Kevin knows it will mean splitting up one happy pride to form another that might fail. There's no guarantee that Thor will accept them. 
And until the lionesses are given contraceptives, it's not a risk he's willing to take. There's been a power struggle developing in one of the hyena groups. Hyenas live in a matriarchal society called a clan, ruled by the females. They use a complex range of body language and vocalizations to communicate with each other and establish their social hierarchy. To avoid conflict, males are lowest in the social rank. Out of the five hyenas in this clan, female Gina is the head. But her daughter Oslo is challenging Gina for supremacy. Hey, what's up with you guys? Eh? Hey, Shans? Kevin is keeping a close eye on them. But this morning, he notices more strange goings on. What's in it? Hey, what's the matter? You all acting nervous, eh? And it turns out, for good reason. Cody? Hey, what's going on with you? We're all acting very strange. I guarantee you something's up. Eh? He's concerned. So he goes to look for her in their underground den. And there's a big surprise in store. What? <laughs> He's got some cups. There's three. She's got three. This is very, very unusual. Hey, my girl. This is the first time she's had three. I feel like a little kid on Christmas. I want to go away to unwrap my present. <laughs> she wasn't showing any signs of giving birth. But these guys are at least a couple of hours old. They born with their eyes fully open. They can see, they can walk around, they can move around. This is amazing because she's actually very calm. Gina's a very protective mother. In fact, ferociously so. You can imagine, she will protect these cubs at all costs. When hyenas breed in the kingdom, just as in the wild, Newborn cubs are sometimes cannibalized by rival adults and even their own siblings. If this happens, surviving orphans are removed to the kingdom's nursery for safety. Kevin will need to keep a close eye on the clan. Turned out to be an awesome day. For Kevin, one of the biggest rewards of all is watching young animals mature into adults. And of those closest to his heart are two lionesses he rescued as cubs. Uh, well, over here we have Megan Amy, probably two lionesses that I'll never have a better relationship with. Uh, our love affair started pretty much eight years ago when mom abandoned them. They probably weigh in at about 180 kilograms each. But their characters are so different. Although they've had the same upbringing, the same input, um, the same amount of love, the same amount of discipline, Amy is a little bit more reserved, sometimes can be petulant. Meg, on the other hand, is just the most boisterous, outgoing, fun-loving lioness you'll ever come across. And that's why I can go swimming in the river with her. She's just full of confidence. If I go in the river, she wants to go in the river. Lions will usually try to avoid going in the water whenever they can. Meg's behavior challenges convention. This seems to be a sign of her extraordinary confidence in Kevin. A big adult lioness coming up, rubbing her head on your face, feeling her tongue. It's like 80 grade sandpaper doing this. You can't stop them from doing it because it's their way of showing affection. So you've just got to endure the pain. And I'll tell you something, it's really worth it. Kevin has worked with big cats for over 12 years. But he has faced criticism. Some people believe he is taking too big a risk with his own life. Yeah, I get, I get criticized all the time for the way I interact with the lions. You know, a lot of people say, do you really need to interact with them that intensely? And, you know, it's, it's the only way I really know. 
Kevin has devoted his life to most of these lions since they were cubs. He believes this is key to the success of his approach. <laughs> By immersing himself in their lives, he can recognize their individual moods, what they like, what they hate, and where their boundaries lie. He refuses to interact with any lions he doesn't know. So Meg and Amy are just those two unique individuals that I can do this kind of thing with quite freely. And truly, if I fell asleep in this enclosure, I honestly can say I'd, I, I fear not that they would jump on me and try and eat me while I'm sleeping. In the wild, numbers of lions across sub-Saharan Africa have declined dramatically. Today, estimates stand at around 25,000, 80% less than 30 years ago. And white lions are the rarest sight of all, in the wild only found in a single area of South Africa. Kevin has been invited to discover just why white lion numbers in their natural environment are facing such a battle for survival. He is flying to the Timbavadi Nature Reserve, part of the Greater Kruger National Park, which covers a vast wilderness area of more than five and a half million acres. Between 2006 and 2010, only 11 white lions were born in the area, and only three are thought to have survived. Kevin has joined Ranger Patrick O'Brien and tracker Albert Ubisi to try and find them. For the last three months, they've been lucky enough to have regular sightings of the white lions near to their safari camp. They are keeping a close eye out for fresh tracks and spore. It's line tracks, it's gone that way. And they're in luck. If they find them, it will be the first time Kevin has seen a white lion in the wild. So, yeah, we're not far now. Um, we've been tracking the lions for some time now, and we know it's the group that we're looking for because we can see the, the adult females and we can also see the cub spur. So just, I reckon, around, around the corner there, um, Albert's uh, told us we should expect to find some lions, hopefully. And a short while later, Kevin is rewarded with his first sighting of two of the rarest lions in the world. This is awesome, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, since December, they've been in this area and have been moving around the camp and seems to be a residence, which is great for us, of course. No, definitely, yeah, definitely. Not every day you see white lions. White lions carry a rare recessive gene that inhibits the production of color in their fur. But they are not albinos. Their paw pads and lips are pigmented, and often their eyes are bluish instead of the usual golden brown. This rare recessive gene is carried by normal tawny lions in this region. Tell me uh, just uh, the dynamics of this pride. What, uh, what, uh, I mean, I can see the two whites and the two browns, but the females, males. The, um, the pride which we see here uh, consists of two adult lionesses. In fact, it's actually three, which are between seven and eight years uh, of age. Well, uh, one is not present at the moment. I'm not sure where she is. She's been absent from the pride for about several weeks now. Sure. Four cups. Uh, Good condition, huh? Yeah, excellent. Two tawny um, lions, which are about 16, 16 and a half, and the two white cubs, which are both females, which are approximately 14 to 15 months old. Young lions, both tawny and white, have a tough time staying alive. As many as 80% of them die before they reach the age of two. One of the greatest threats to any youngster is when a dominant male takes over a new pride 
and tries to kill the offspring of the rival male. But I mean, that just goes to highlight how difficult it is um, for the white to survive. I mean, we know mortality in high lions is high. That's correct, yeah. But I mean, the fact that these lions have made it to 14 months, that's yeah, a really, it's really done very well, good yeah. sign. Yeah. Luckily for these girls, both are females, and of course that's very important to, uh, for the old pride and for us, of course, which means that girls always stay in a pride, they never emigrate. Uh, of course, lionesses are the core foundation of a pride, and with these two girls staying in the pride, it just means that, of course, it's going to be great in the future to see these two girls grow up and become adults. Isn't that going to be fantastic? I've Can you imagine yeah, coming here white. in, uh, in uh, two or three years from now and seeing these massive adult white lions hunting? I'll, I'll, and, uh, I'm going to be back, I'll tell you that be much. Very, I will be back. Very impressive. In captivity, white lion numbers are higher than the wild due to breeding programs. But in their natural habitat, Kevin believes their best chance of survival is to conserve the dwindling tawny lion population that carries the gene. As you know, at the kingdom, uh, several white lions that I work with and I've always just been maintaining that we should be conserving the tawny gene in this area specifically. And, you know, when I was told that these cubs were born, I was yeah. like, you see, I mean, that, that just goes to prove that there's tawnies carrying the gene. You know, the, both mothers are tawny, and yeah. uh, that clearly indicates that, you know, you don't have to be a, a white lioness Precisely. to produce white cups. And there's a very good chance, and maybe that uh, white gene is a lot more prevalent than what we actually think it is. And even more reason to be protecting exactly. these tawnies in this area. Exactly, yeah. and, and this is what's so important about this area, is the fact, you know, this is the only place that they are naturally f yeah. still found. Yeah. The trip has given Kevin time to reflect on the role he'd like the kingdom to play in lion conservation. If he can transform the park so it can open to the public, he hopes it will help inspire people to fight for the protection of lions in the wild. But first, Kevin must find a way to fund the kingdom. And he's about to find out just how tough this will be. The premiere of the movie has finally arrived. As fearless as Kevin is with big cats, the glare of the spotlight is enough to rattle his nerves. I'm very anxious because premieres are nerve-wracking as it is. You've got almost 400 people coming to watch the, the film and you, you want to be at your most relaxed. I'm not at my most relaxed. I'm, I'm a bundle of nerves and uh, I've, I've got lead weights on my shoulder and I'm demotivated and my mind's spinning. I uh, haven't slept a wink. I don't, I, I don't even know if I want to attend. Despite his initial trepidation, Kevin puts on a brave face for the press. Well, it's, it's tricky because when you're working with uh, um, animals that can eat you... A foreign world to Kevin is a potential lifeline for the kingdom. They're hoping if the film does well in South Africa, it could be released globally. I'm not joking. I mean, the film took four years to make. And believe you me, when a lion doesn't want to do something, he doesn't. And you need to really listen to him. You better listen to him. Over the next few days, the movie receives its first reviews. City vibe, yeah, feline feast. Um, four out of five. They're good, but Kevin has to wait to see if they are reflected in the box office takings. The proof is in the pudding. Uh, the public are the ones that will say whether this movie stays or goes. So we hold thumbs and we... Nerve, nerve-wracking times. This weekend's going to be a little bit of an anxious uh, wait, you know, to see what the numbers are. Back with the big king's pride, Kevin is checking up on Kaiser. He's determined to find him a new home, to put an end to the trouble he has been causing among the other males. But he just can't find anywhere that wants to take him. A lion like Kaiser, obviously, we'd like to find him a really good home. So you've got to go into, you know, the details of who's this person, how long have they been involved with lions, um, do they have the right uh, documentation, what's the facility like, 
what's his enclosure going to be like? Because he's really been used to a great life. It could take months to find Kaiser the kind of home where he will be safe for the rest of his days. In South Africa, unscrupulous overbreeding of lions by some parks and zoos means that there is no market for any surplus animals. Some of them even end up being sold for what are called canned lion hunts, in which they are released only to be shot by trophy hunters. For now, Kaiser is here to stay. With all the other enclosures at the kingdom full, there was nowhere else to put him. It's an anxious time. Kevin can only hope the big kings settle their differences, and soon. Over in the nursery, lion cubs Mufumu and Vietsi are fast approaching adolescence. They have outgrown the nursery enclosure and need to live with other lions soon. If they don't, they risk never learning to socialize as part of a pride. I'm a firm uh, <laughs> believer in, in cradle to grave. And for every animal that you hand raise, you really are responsible for his destiny. So if, if an animal has been taken away for whatever the reason, uh, it's a lifetime commitment. And you've got to really figure out what's going to happen with that animal when it gets older. Come, boys. Come, Fumu. Come, boys. Come, boys. Mafumu and Vietzi now have a big week ahead of them. Come. 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 Good boys. Rodney is taking them for the first of a series of phased introductions to what will be their new pride, the so-called terrible teens. Mafumu and Vietzi are younger, so the introduction needs to be planned carefully to stop any serious fights breaking out. Lions establishing their hierarchy in a pride, both in the wild and in captivity, will frequently injure each other. Kevin is worried that the terrible teens may gang up on the young pair. So he's decided to split up the six strong pride into two groups of three. First, he will introduce Mufumu and Vietzi to Tristan, Zippo, and Nash. I'm a little bit apprehensive because these three are, are, are notoriously aggressive, um, especially when it comes to um, lions, uh, other lions that they don't know. But they, you know, they speak a different language to us, so maybe they'll know something that we don't. Uh, maybe Mafumo and Vietzi, being smaller and younger, will just submit. If that happens, it's fantastic. If it doesn't, we'll have to uh, conjure up another plan. Hello, boys! Oh! Hello, boys! Nicely. Who's that? Look, they've been so nice and friendly. Despite Kevin's initial anxiety, the feisty young lions stay relaxed. This is much, much better than I expected. I really, this is phenomenal. There was like almost some form of, you know, acknowledgement that we know we are a little bit weaker than you guys, you three, we two, we younger. So it was really, really good. Some new friends. Oh, it is so tempting to release Mafuma and Vietzi with this group because it's gone so well. But in, in all the years of experience, I've realized one thing, overconfidence is a bad thing. And I just think we should wait probably another one or two introductions like this before we release, because it's a, it's, they can almost lure you into a false sense of security. Um, where you think, ah, everything's okay, and as soon as you open this gate, it's a different story. Now there's a bigger test in store. Mafumu and Vietzi are about to meet the other, more unpredictable half of the terrible teens. Bandit. The unruly trio Bobcat, Bandit, and Gabby are the oldest of the terrible teens' pride. They're about to meet cubs Mafumu and Vietzi for the very first time. They could easily gang up on the younger lions. So for their safety, Kevin keeps Mafumu and Vietzi in the cage. 
But as the older lions approach, Vietzi makes a sudden and aggressive challenge. Come on, be nice. Be nice. Vietzi, why are you being a naughty boy? Don't be a naughty boy. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Eh? That was really incredible interaction. It, it, it went exactly opposite to how I thought. I thought the youngsters would be a lot more submissive and roll on their backs, and that these guys would show some aggression and show some authority. It was exactly the opposite. The, the youngsters came at them full of aggression, and these guys were completely passive. <laughs> How are you doing in and amongst all of this? Over the next hour, Kevin waits patiently as the lions sort out their differences, separated by the bars of the cage. Hey, Vajetsi! Okay. So I think uh, what I'm going to do is let them all out together. They actually, we've done this a couple of times. Um, there's hardly any interest. The only line that's really showing any form of aggression is Vajetsi. That's because he's a bit nervous. Mafumu is completely relaxed. These guys are not going to do anything bad. I think if anything, it's going to come aggression from the youngsters. These guys might give a wah, 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 and it's going to be all over. So I'm going to go and let them out. Be nice. OK. But Vietzi's initial bravado quickly fades, and he becomes submissive. Bobcat and Bandit seize the chance to gang up on the younger lion, and Kevin has no choice but to break up the fight with pepper spray. Stop, 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 stop. Stop, 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 stop. I just got a, a hunch that it would be okay to let them all out. They're all in jolly moods. And especially the youngsters have been extremely submissive. So that's... Uh, <laughs> until Mr. Bandit decided to pick on them. <clears throat> and once he started picking on them, Bobcat came in from behind, where I had to defuse the situation with a little bit of help from a friend called Pepper Spray. <laughs> Nice. I want nice, nice. Nice, nice. As an emergency backup, Kevin carries a can of pepper spray to stop dangerous fights breaking out. If he's caught in the middle, an accidental bite from a lion could seriously injure him. It's extremely rare he ever needs to use pepper spray. And in this case, it's Kevin that suffers the consequences. With the introduction between Mafumu and Vietzi and this half of the terrible teens a failure, it's back to the drawing board. The process is going to be far more complicated than Kevin had thought. In the meantime, Mafumu and Vietzi will need to go back to live in the nursery. And this isn't the only conflict in the kingdom that Kevin needs to resolve. He's received a call that two of Gina's cubs have disappeared. Hello, Gina. Hey, Ma. How's your cub? Hey. He wants to check up on Gina's one remaining baby. What's happening? Hello, my girl. But the matriarch is out of the den and appears restless. Why are you out the den? And Kevin has no idea that there's yet another surprise in store. There's three. Hey, my girl. Hello, Gina. There's three hyenas. <laughs> Hold on, I'm a bit confused, Joe. Yeah. You're not going to believe this Oslo. Hey. There must be her cubs. I didn't even know she was pregnant. Hey, hello, my girl. Hello, Gina. Hello. Gina's remaining cub is still alive, but her daughter, Oslo, has also taken up residence in the den and given birth to two more cubs. Kevin believes it's likely Oslo has killed and eaten her mother's cubs in a battle for superiority. But despite this, for now, Gina and Oslo seem to have settled their differences, hyena style. The fact that she's in the den and she's looking after the cubs, it looks like she's looking after the cubs, it's really good news. 
And the other thing that's really good news is that Gina and her were both in the den. There's no fighting, and all the cubs are doing well, so it's fantastic. With both mothers relaxed, Kevin hopes peace has finally been restored in the clan. But the truce doesn't last long. What's going on in here, guys? Eh? A few days later, two more cubs have disappeared from the hyena den, and Kevin is back to find them. My goodness, what's going on here? Eh? Matriarch Gina is avoiding the den again. Not a good sign. She seems a little bit uh, calm and friendly, and that's a bit worrying, because if she had a cub, she would be a lot more uh, cautious and uh, protective. Gina's not the only one behaving strangely. Her daughter Oslo and male Shanzi are raising their tails a clear sign of aggression towards Kevin. These guys are showing signs of a little bit too much aggression, and I think we should start hopping out of here, right? Back in the den, Kevin goes to look for the remaining cub. Let's just see if I can entice him down here. This is crazy. Now he's faced with a dilemma. Leave the cub under the care of its natural mother and hope he survives, or remove him. There's definitely been some chaos on outside. I've looked everywhere, and I can't find the other two siblings. It looks like either Gina, Gina's probably come and uh, killed one of Oslo's. And Oslo's in return kill one of Gina's, so Gina's got no cubs left. And Oslo's only got one, and I'm just afraid that if I leave this cub here, I'm gonna have no cubs whatsoever. Come by. Kevin reaches a decision. If the cub is to have any chance of growing up, he needs to take it away from the clan. The hard work of hand raising the cub now begins. It's a 24 7 commitment. And with more mouths to feed, Kevin is eagerly awaiting news of the movie release. Figures are in from the box office. It's not good news. They won't be enough to keep the kingdom up and running and the animals safe. Kevin needs to find a new approach to raising funds, and fast. The park needs to be um, operating and basically paying for itself uh, in, in about six months from now. And if that isn't the case, yeah, again, it's going to be quite a, a battle to, to uh, see where we can kind of get funding from and uh, see if we can save it, because um, I would hate nothing more than to see this place go and the animals in it. It's uh, my life and soul. At home, Kevin's wife Mandy is also starting to feel the strain. It's just finding the balance between the pressure of the farm and also working together as a couple, working, you know, we work together at home, we live together, we do everything together, so it's just having to balance all of that sometimes does get a bit stressful. Hello, Ishki. To add to the stress, they know that finding good homes for all of the big cats would be near impossible. The consequences for those who work at the kingdom and the animals could be serious. We've been with these animals since they were young, so they are like, we are part of their family. I don't even want to think about what it would do to me if I, for some reason oh, the lions are taken away from me or I'm taken away from them. Um, it would, yeah, it would be, I don't know how to describe it. Twelve years ago, I made a little pact with two lions called Town Napoleon. And the commitment was to really see them through to 
uh, old age. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, basically a lifetime commitment. And I'm not going to throw in the towel uh, just because we've got a couple of financial uh, issues. Yeah. Yeah. The next few weeks will be crucial. Yeah. Time is running out for the kingdom of the white lion.